Hello, so I know that um, my people who are watching this on YouTube read chapter four um, on their own time. So I will do chapter five. Now it's quite long, so I'm going to split it into two. I'm going to read some of it here at school right now, and then I will finish the rest at home. So it's called chapter five and it's called Ava. I would have liked to sleep outside under the stars again, but angry clouds had formed in the sky just as the sun was setting. We swept up the sawdust and Ivan dragged one mattress out into the middle of the living room. It's almost like you're outside, said Marussia. This is a big room and if you need us, we're right here. She pointed out to the bedroom. The look in her eyes told me that she was exhausted and I knew that Ivan was even more tired. So I smiled and said, that would be fine. I took Miss McIntosh's word book to bed with me and I looked at the pictures and tried to sound out the words until it got dark. The rain pounding on the rooftop muffled the sound of frogs, or maybe frogs slept inside during the rain too. The rain was comforting, but the distant grumbling of thunder reminded me of gunfire. The windows were bare, so when a car passed, strange shapes played across the walls. I closed my eyes and concentrated on breathing deeply, and I hoped I would fall asleep quickly. Then here's a flashback. I'm snuggled under a down comforter, surrounded by people who love me. I hear pounding on my door. I try to snuggle in and hide behind the others, but they're, they've melted away. I'm alone. More pounding at the door. A child's voice asking me to open up. Who is that child and why is her voice terrifying me? Okay, that's the end of the flashback. I sat up with a jolt. Where was I? A frog chirped. I looked around in the darkness and saw moonlight coming in through the window. Rain was pounding on the rooftop. I was in Ivan's house in Bradford. The room with, had no furniture and smelled of freshy sanded, freshly sanded wood. It was, I was safe here. I wrapped my arms around my legs and rocked myself back and forth. I felt like screaming, but I didn't know why. I closed my eyes and I chanted the Kali Sanka under my breath. That might be um, a song that she likes. I'm not really sure. I, I'm uh, assuming it's a Ukrainian word. Who was the girl I had dreamed of? I did not want to go back to sleep and I did not want to wake up Ivan and Marussia. So I tiptoed into the kitchen and poured myself a glass of water. I sat down at the table and watched the raindrops on the kitchen window. I wanted to remember that time. If I could figure out the puzzle, maybe the nightmares would go away. Marussia and I had nothing to be ashamed of, but how could she know that for sure? I stared out the window thinking of that girl. Another flashback. I'm in the bedroom with the high ceiling. Raindrops trickle outside pink curtained windows and I see the beginning of the daylight peeking around the edges. There's a tap tapping on the door. It flies open and Ava bounds in. Sister, you should be up by now. She scrambles up onto my bed. Wear your new pink dress, she said. Then we'll match. I watch her chubby feet <laughs> as she slides off the bed and skips out the door. No one looking at us together would ever think that we match, even if we both dress in pink. I stay in bed for a moment together. Why do I not feel safe in this room? It is all it is all a girl could hope for with its pink ruffled curtains and a soft four poster bed. A wooden box in a corner brims with stuffed toys on the wall. Across from the bed is a high shelf holding a row of perfectly blonde blue eyed dolls, a gift from Fatel, which means father. I do not like them. As I get out of bed, one foot lands on a sharp corner of a book. I bend down, pick it up. Der Giftpilz, the poisonous mushroom. Another gift from Vata that I do not like. It slips out of my hands and crashes back to the floor. I brush the wrinkles out of my nightgown and walk barefoot to the bathroom. The air is damp and the mirror is covered with steam. Muta must have given gotten up herself. That means mother. She's probably waiting in the dining room for Ava and me. I grab my toothbrush, I smear it with toothpaste, and give my teeth a quick brushing. I splash water on my face, making sure I dampen my soap bar so it looks like I used it and then dry off <laughs> and then dry off with a pink towel so that towel that is stitched with the initials GH, just like my other towels. That's the end of the flashback. A crack of thunder jolted me out of the past. Just for a second, the kitchen was day daylight bright from lightning. The scene in my mind was still so vivid that I could almost feel the grit of my toothpaste against my tongue. I took a slow sip from the glass of water on the table in front of me and tried to remember, but the moment had passed. Was that girl Ava my sister? Why did I not love her? There was nothing in that memory that was frightening, so why did it scare me? And what did GH stand for? I did not want to go back to sleep, so I stayed sitting at the table, watched the rain and more lightning through the kitchen window. 
I'd had enough food and fine clothing back then. I'd had a mucho and a vata and Ava. Why was I not happy? It was still dark, and then I heard the creak of footsteps on the wooden floor and the sound of the bathroom door swinging open. Ivan was getting ready for work. Through the kitchen window, there was now a bare glimmer of morning light. I could see the outline of the swing shimmering with rain. I remember how happy Ivan was when he surprised me with it. Maybe I could surprise him now. I walked over to the sink, filled it with kettle water for tea, and put it on the burner. I found a frying pan, set it on the other burner, and took out some bacon for the icebox and placed it in the frying pan. As the bacon sizzled, I cracked two eggs into the pan. By the time the bathroom door opened, breakfast was waiting at the table at Ivan's spot. He came into the kitchen in his work shirt and pants smelling of soap with his wet hair combed back. Nadia, he said, glancing at me, and then the plate. What a surprise! I could tell from the look in his eyes that he had a thousand questions. I couldn't sleep, I told him, and I wanted to do something special for you. Ivan walked up behind my chair. He hugged my shoulders and kissed me at the top of the head. You're such a sweet girl, he said. Thank you. Eat, I told him, swallowing back tears. It will get cold. Ivan ate quickly and gulped down his tea. I knew that he didn't want to be late for work. After he left, I washed the dishes and prepared breakfast for Marussia and myself. I took the word book with me and Marussia dropped me off at Miss McIntosh's house after breakfast and we practiced new words and phrases. My Chilo came after lunch, just as, he's done the, just, as, just as he'd done the day before, but he seemed somehow nicer. He sat at the kitchen table with his workbook while I sat in the living room with Miss McIntosh. Hours flew by. <laughs> You learned so quickly, Nadia, Miss McIntosh said with a smile. She took the workbook from my lap and closed it and then set it on the coffee table. Would you like to take this book home again with you? Yes, please, I said. Why don't I bring Nadia to the library today, my child said from the kitchen. She's, she'd, then she'd get to practice her English with different books. Miss McIntosh's face brightened. What a lovely idea, my child. If Marusia comes back before you two are finished at the library, tell her where you are. My Chilo didn't take me directly to the library. Instead, we walked around town for a bit. He showed me the movie theater, the market square, and city hall. There was a long gray car parked out front of the city hall. I think that's the mayor's, said my Chilo. When we got to the library, we went to the big white steps to the glass doors and opened them. I was enveloped by a whoosh of cold air and the scent of books, furniture, the scent of books and furniture polish. The children's department is this way, said my Chilo, taking me to a set of inside stairs that went down to the basement. We walked up to the long counter in the middle of the main room for, for a library. This room had surprisingly few books. The walls were wood paneled and empty of shelves. Can't we go in there, I said, pointed to the room on the left that was filled with books. We've got to find Miss Barry first, said my child. You need to get a library card. Okay, I think that's about half of the chapter. So again, I will read the other half at home. I will see you then. Bye. Okay, I'm back home. Here is Cloud. <laughs> he likes to have his head rubbed, hey, buddy? He's home all evening by himself because I had parent-teacher conferences, but they're over now. Okay, he wants to go. He's done. Bye-bye. All right, so where did I leave off here? So she needs a library card. Just then a pretty woman with blonde curls and blue framed glasses came in. Good to see you, my cello, she said. So you brought a friend. This is Nadia. Um, I did a little curtsy and I said, hello, Miss Barry. Nadia needs a library card, said my cello. I can help her with the form. Miss Barry went behind the counter and looked through the drawers. She handed me a pencil and a sheet of paper with questions and lines on it. I need a phone number and address. My heart sank. We do not have a phone, I said. Did that mean I couldn't have a library card? My cello took out the form from my hand. I'll fill it out, he said, and I'll put the phone number of the foundry where your father works. My father works there too, and I know the number. Thank you, my cello. He led me into the room on the left. These are good ones to start with, he said. I gasped as I stepped into the room. All four walls were covered with shelves of books and there were aisles of books as well. Um, this is a flashback here. A long ago room filled with books, so many books, but I was forbidden to touch them. And now the flashback is over. You should try this book, my cello said. He handed me one that read the and read the title out loud, The Little Engine That Could. I'll be in the other room for a while, so come and find me if you get bored. I held the book up to my face and breathed in its lovely scent of ink and glue. It seemed hard to believe that I 
would be allowed to take a book home from this place. I opened it up. The images of the story niggled at my memory. A train chugging along, boxes of toys, a blonde doll with blue eyes. Maybe this wasn't the book for me. I put it back on the shelf and pulled out one that had a painting of three little kittens on the front. Using the picture as clues, I read as much as I could while I stood there. Kittens, mittens, cry. I did the same with a few more books. How could I ever choose? I put them all back on the shelf and wandered into the other room. The books were thicker and they didn't have as many pictures. I found my cello sitting in a corner surrounded by books. Which one are you going to take out? I asked him. He looked at me and then back at the books on the floor. I think I'll take Tom Sawyer today, he said. Aren't you getting one? I can't decide, I said. I'll show you some that I liked when I first came to Brantford, he said. He stacked the books on the floor and set them on a wheeled cart. With Tom Sawyer tucked in the corner of his arms, he walked to the picture book room with me following close behind. Here's a good one, he said, reaching up and grabbing an oversized book from the shelf at the back. Um, it will help teach you the word, the words for numbers in English. It was a counting book very similar to Miss McIntosh's word book. Thanks, my cello, I said. This is perfect. When we got home, Ivan was stretched out on the floor in our living room, carefully tapping his nails into the narrow strip of wood along the bottom of the wall. Can I get you anything? I asked. Ivan looked up from his work and smiled. I would love some water. I went into the kitchen and set my library book on the table. I filled a glass with tap water and brought it out to the living room for Ivan. He drank it down slowly and handed the glass back to me. When I took it back into the kitchen, I stood for a moment and stared out the window. I could see my own reflection there, my face, my eyes, my braids. Another flashback. I'm wearing the pink dress. The sight of it makes me feel sick. When I get downstairs, Mucho is at the dining room table. Cook has served porridge and Eva is halfway through hers. On the table, a crystal serving dish filled with berries, apples, and grapes. Cook places a bowl in front of me sprinkled with cinnamon and sugar. Even so, I hate it. The rally is in less than an hour, says Mucha, her eyes sparkling with excitement. Eat quickly. Eva shovels the last of her porridge into her mouth and swallows it down. She puts the spoon on the table with a clatter and stands up. I'm finished. Go get your hairbrush, says Mucha. I'll fix your hair as soon as your sister and I finish with our breakfast. I swallow the cereal quickly as I can, not caring much what it tastes like, but just to get it over with. Eva comes back with her pink ribbons and hairbrush and a hand mirror. Mucha brushes out the tangles from Eva's dark blonde hair until it bangs, hang, sorry, hangs down her back in shiny waves. She expertly makes two braids, finishing off each with a pink ribbon. When it is my turn, Mucho tugs up my hair braids and braids it up more tightly than she needs to. There, she says, with a cold edge in her voice. She hands me the mirror. Don't she look lovely? The face that looks back at me is the same one as always. I never think of myself as lovely. Um, a long black car with small with a small swastika flag on each side of the hood idles in the driveway. As we walk outside, a uniformed man opens the back door. Muto gets in, then Ava, then me. The upholstery is lush black leather that gleams from a fresh buffing. The car door is closed with a firm click and we speed away. It takes half an hour of fast driving to get into the city. The streets narrow. Our driver slows down so we can wave to the blocks and blocks of cheering crowds. When we get within walking distance of the car, of sorry, of the stage, the car stops. Soldiers push the crowd away so we can get out and then they lead us to the steps on the side of the stage. Most of the chairs are taken by Nazi officers, but there are a few mother and but there are a few mothers and children as well. We take our spots in front in the front row behind the podium. The crowd roars as another long black car pulls up. When the Führer steps out, the crowd goes wild. Bata gets out of the car just behind the Führer. The crowd chants, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, as the Führer steps on the stage, but it is as if he doesn't notice. He walks up to me and crouches down until we are eye level. He is so close to me that I can see his nose hair and smell the slightly spicy scent of his hair pomade. What a perfect specimen of Aryan youth you are, my dear, he says, pinching my cheek. I smile. What else can I do? Vato stands behind the field, bursting with pride. But Eva looks like she's about to cry, and Mucha's lips are thin and are a thin white line. Vato sits down between Eva and Mucha. Vato grabs Mucha's hand and kisses it. The field walks on the podium and begins to... And then the flashback is over.
Nadia, what are you doing? I nearly jumped out of my skin at the sound of Marussia's voice. The empty glass almost shot out of my hand. I blinked twice. I turned to Marussia. She stood by the table with Ivan beside her, his hammer in one hand and a look of concern on his face. I shook my head, desperate to clear away the image of Hitler's face. If I'd met Hitler, Hitler himself, then I must be a Nazi. What secret was Marussia keeping from me? Who was I? Okay, two more pages until chapter six. My face was wet with tears, but I couldn't remember crying. My legs felt wobbly, and I set the glass beside the sink and sat down at the table. Marussia walked behind my chair. She wrapped her arms protectively around me and rested her head on my neck. Ivan knelt beside us. Are you all right? He asked. His eyes were round with fright. I was just thinking, I told them. You were shouting Heil Hitler, said Ivan, a troubled look in his eyes. What are you thinking about, said Marussia. The farmhouse and that family, I said. But there was more. Do you want to talk about it? She asked. No. I, couldn't she understand how ashamed I was? Marussia insisted that I wasn't a Nazi, but that's not what my memory was telling me. How I wished I could wash away the horrible past. You need to air these memories, Nadia, said Ivan. And until you remember it all, you'll keep having nightmares. Was Ivan right? Maybe he was. Would it help if I told you about what happened to me during the war, he asked. He straddled the chair facing me and looking and looked into my eyes. Ivan's offer surprised me. He never talked about his past. I would like to hear what you did during the war, I told him. For a minute, he said nothing. I saw his eyes fill with tears as memories came drifting into his mind. He blinked the tears back and took a breath. My story is one, like so many others. The Soviets killed my father and brother in 1941. They were killing thousands of men, even some of the women and children. I wasn't arrested with them. I thought at the time that I was lucky, but then the Nazis came. Ivan's eyes met mine and I could feel my face flush with shame. He looked up at Marussia, who still stood behind me, her arms wrapped around me. Ivan gave a ragged sigh. I thought nothing could compare to the Soviets, but I was wrong. The Nazis were just as bad. My sister was captured in a Nazi slave raid. My mother was sent to a concentration camp. I was the last of my family. I joined the underground. Sometimes we fought the Nazis and sometimes we fought the Soviets. It depended on which front was closest. I escaped to the DP camp just as the war was ending. So much sadness in so few words. I'm so sorry, Ivan. I could fe feel tears spilling down my cheeks. I needed to say that out loud, said Ivan, and you should talk to us about what you remember. Maybe he was right, but I just couldn't do it yet. We were silent for a long time, each of us wrapped in our own thoughts. As I sat there, I tried to piece together what I now remember about my past. The rich farmhouse with a bedroom filled with toys, a pink dress that I hated. Why did I hate it? Towel stitched with GH. What did GH stand for? Were Mucho, Fata, and Eva my real family? The scent of meeting Hitler face to face, sorry, the scene of meeting Hitler face to face was etched in my brain. How I wished I could scrub that away, but it was so vivid right down to his smell. Ivan hated the Nazis. Look at what they'd done to his own mother and sister. If I were a Nazi, then how could Ivan love me? How could anyone love me? But how could I argue with these flashes from the past? My name wasn't really Nadia, it's something with a G. The farmhouse, the long black car, and Hitler. These images were like photographs in my mind. I knew how easily Marussia could lie. She Was li was she lying to me about my past? <sighs> it's a lot of reading. So the next chapter is called Lilacs, and that is chapter 6. And... Let's see if that one is as long as this past one. Um, I think it's a bit shorter. Okay, thanks for watching and hope you have a good school day. Again, be good for your teachers. And um, 